Today we're going to uh, continue with our Kingdom Christianity series. I'm going back and forth now between Romans and the Kingdom Christianity series. And um, as I did the introduction to the Kingdom Christianity series, it really focuses on four things. The perfect finished work of Christ, number one, which is the foundation and basis for everything else. Then the fullness and baptism and gifts of the Spirit that grow out of the perfect finished work of Christ. Thirdly is the unity and community in the body that, uh, again, really finds its root and source of love in the perfect finished work of Christ. And fourthly is the radical inclusive worldview of how we relate to people in the world, that uh, people in the world are attracted to us rather than repelled by us, as they often are with Christians. Uh, Jesus was loved by the people of the world rather than hated by them. And uh, as God's kingdom people, we want to be radically inclusive in terms of how we share his love and the good news of grace. So today, uh, which is just the second s sermon in this series, I'm going to be uh, starting with the perfect finished work of Christ. And um, I'm going to look at the passage that was most pivotal and, and important for me in recognizing that the perfect finished work, that you can't be under that fully and under the law at the same time. And, and this passage was really the most critical and the most crucial in scripture in helping me uh, come to that understanding. So anyway, before we open the word, I'd like us to just bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, I thank you for each person here. Thank you for those who can't be here today. Pray your blessing on them. But Father, we just would ask that your spirit would touch each person here through your word so that uh, each person will get exactly what you have for them and desire for them today as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The story is told of a uh, heart surgeon who uh, had been well known in his community for many, many, many years, several decades. And he was dearly loved, and when he finally died in his uh, 70s, uh, there was a huge funeral. They used the largest church in the city to house this funeral, and there were several thousand people. The, the church was totally full as people came out to honor the surgeon and to celebrate his life and to listen to the many testimonies that were shared about how this man touched them. And one of the neat things about this funeral was that... Uh, as the man was lying in his casket in the front of the church, there was this huge, gigantic heart representing his life's work right behind that casket. And after all the testimonies and everything was shared, they concluded the service by having this huge heart open up, and they put the casket inside the heart and then closed it again. And it was a very moving, powerful service, and people were crying. But one colleague of the surgeon started laughing, and he started laughing out loud. He started laughing hysterically. And the funeral director came over to the man, and he said, are you okay? Why, why are you laughing this way? And the colleague said, well, you know, I've worked in the same community with this same man for all these decades, and suddenly I just started to visualize my own funeral. And the funeral director said, well, what do you mean? What, What's your specialty? He said, well, my whole life I've done nothing but colonoscopies. So that would make for an interesting funeral. But uh, <laughs> I want to ask this morning, what would your funeral be like if uh, your casket was rolled into an object that would symbolize your life, that would uh, kind of represent what you do? And uh, I'm sure my wife would probably say that my casket would get rolled into a big book, you know, that would open up and close or something. And now that she's retired, I I'd be tempted to say that uh, her casket might get rolled into a big watermelon or a tomato because she <laughs> loves her garden so much. But, uh, you know, the, the truth is at a deeper level that I think God would see each one of us have our caskets rolled into a big heart just like that surgeon had because God looks at the heart he knows us by our heart and uh, the Bible talks about this a lot if you just read 
uh, concordance, all the times the heart is mentioned. Um, it's very fascinating what the Bible reveals about the heart and how God sees us through our hearts. And uh, today, um, as I said, I'm going to look at a passage that really convicted me that um, my understanding of theology, my training uh, in seminary and doctoral work and all this thing in a particular church missed one of the most important, if not the most important, teaching of the Bible. That the complete, perfect, finished work of Christ does not allow us to be under the old covenant law anymore. And when we try to mix those two, we run into all kinds of problems. And uh, just to give you a little of the history of this, um, I was in college and seminary in the 70s and finished seminary in the late 70s. And uh, I, my two favorite theologians in the church I grew up in were Desmond Ford and Robert Brensmead. And they were both Australians. And they were both just constantly focused, at least during the 70s, on justification by faith, righteousness by faith, what this meant. Of course, Ford got kicked out of the church right in the late 70s uh, for his teachings. And, uh, but, but even after he was no longer in the church, he continued to believe that we're under law. He, he continued to talk about the Ten Commandments and all this as he had before. But that wasn't true with Brinsmead. Brinsmead published uh, a magazine that I dearly loved. It was first called Present Truth and then it became Verdict. And you can still go back online and read these publications. But um, in the late 70s, right about the time Ford was being put out of the church, Brinsmead left the church. And, and he left the church on the basis that the church missed the most basic tenet of the gospel, which is that we're not under law anymore we're fully and completely under grace, and we're under the law of the Spirit, not the Old Covenant law. And he started teaching this, and I can still remember uh, in 1982, his September verdict was on this whole subject, and, and it was on the passage I'm going to preach on today, uh, 2 Corinthians 3. And he demonstrated from this passage how it's impossible to think that you're under the Old Covenant law and be under grace fully at the same time. That there's a huge conflict here that has all kinds of practical implications. And so that was the beginning point of me really questioning this whole teaching that I'd grown up with. And, you know, I, I contemplated that for years. Uh, the, the second person after Brinsmead that really got me on this wavelength was Dr. David Martin Lloyd-Jones. And uh, Brinsmead quoted him a lot, so I started buying his books and reading his books. And uh, in my Romans series, I'll quote from him a lot, because uh, this man was so strong on the perfect finished work of Christ and how we must understand that we're not under the old covenant law in relation to this, that uh, I really saturated myself with a lot of his stuff during the 80s and into the 90s, and, and then when I started preaching this in Adventist settings, uh, as you can imagine, I started getting in big trouble, and ultimately that led to uh, me being put out. And, and I think it was this doctrine more than any other uh, that, that led to uh, you know, the church saying, this guy is just too ridiculous. But um, anyway, we start today in 2 Corinthians 3, 2 and 3. And uh, Paul makes this contrast here between the letter and the spirit, between a heart of stone and a heart of the spirit. And um, this is a theme that he runs with throughout this entire chapter. Stone versus heart, letter versus spirit. And this is a theme that you find really throughout scripture. Uh, when you go to Jeremiah 31, 31 to 33, the new covenant. Uh, this is the new covenant I will make with the house of Israel. Uh, again, it brings up the same theme. Um, they will no longer be under the letter, the stone. Uh, they will no longer be under the old covenant law. It won't be the covenant that I made with their fathers. I will give them a new covenant that will be of the spirit that will give them a new heart. 
And you see the same thing in Ezekiel. Ezekiel 11, 19 talks about the same thing. I will take away their heart founded in stone and give them a heart of my spirit. Uh, the same thing in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will take away their heart of stone based in the stone of law and give them a heart of spirit. Give them a new heart. Uh, the same basic passage is found in Hebrews 8, 10 to 12. Um, where once again, God, through the author of Hebrews, says, uh, I will take away this heart of stone, this covenant of stone, this mentality of law and letter, and replace it with the law of the Spirit, with a heart of the Spirit. And uh, so this is a theme that runs throughout much of Scripture. And, um, you know, I'm basically calling my sermon today King of Hearts that God's all about the heart. The heart is the thing that he's most concerned about. And sometimes people ask me, well, are you saying, Pastor, that if a person's under law or they've grown up in a church that's under law, that they're lost? And I'm not saying that at all. You know, I think it's very important to understand that the heart and spiritual experience never gets trumped by theology. Right theology never trumps right heart or right experience. And I know many people that have grown up in religion under law who have a right heart towards God. Uh, they have a heart for God. And even though their theology may not be right, uh, their heart is right. And uh, God blesses them and works with them and through them because their heart is right. And um, God looks at the heart. So, you know, I'd much rather have a right heart and wrong theology than have right theology and a wrong heart. Obviously, the ideal that God wants is that we have right theology and a right heart. You know, that's the best combination. And none of us have perfect theology. We're all going to be learning and growing. So we would never say that we have perfect theology. But the more Christ-centered, the more focused our theology is in the perfect finished work of Christ, the more it will reap uh, all the joys and benefits and blessings that come with a healthy theology. But, um, you know, I, I want to thank Marvin and Helen for loaning me a couple books. Uh, I, I really am blessed by Kenneth Hagin, and I hadn't read either of these books until they gave them to me a couple weeks ago. But The Spirit Within and The Spirit Upon, uh, this is a really important distinction. And you can have the spirit within even if you're under law. You know, there are many people that have a heart for God. They grew up with the wrong theology. They grew up under law. Uh, they have a lot of conflicts and difficulties because of that. But they still have a heart for God. And God's spirit is still working in their lives and working through them. But um, the spirit upon is based on being baptized with the Holy Spirit. And if you don't have a theology of being baptized with the Holy Spirit, then you're not going to have the Spirit upon you. And that was, of course, a major emphasis in the New Testament church, that people were always encouraged to make sure they were baptized in the Holy Spirit as well as believing in Jesus. And it was this combination that led the gifts of the Spirit then to flow. And speaking of the gifts of the Spirit... Uh, his book on tongues here is also very good. I was really blessed by it. Uh, I encourage you to uh, read his works because um, even though he's a very powerful, charismatic, more so than some of us have grown up with or are used to, I really am impressed that he has quite a balanced theology that uh, I, I found very few things that uh, I disagreed with in what he had to say. But um, anyway, um, when we look at this whole issue of right theology, you know, I, I think it's very important to be humble in that and not have this kind of condescending attitude of we're right and everyone else is wrong. That, that's the kind of thing you often find in denominationalism, and that's the, the spirit that comes from the religious spirit. So we want to recognize that God has a huge toolbox. He uses all kinds of people. And uh, in his kingdom, we want to have that kind of openness and radical inclusiveness. 
Um, but at the same time, we want to recognize that God is the source of every good thing. And when we start with the perfect finished work of the cross, then we recognize that every good thing comes from him. It's all about him. All glory belongs to him. There are no good works that we do that have any merit at all. And that's what Paul's saying here in verses 5 and 6 of 2 Corinthians 3. He says, our sufficiency is totally of God. Our sufficiency comes fully and completely from God. We have no sufficiency of our own. Our works are worthless. Our works are dead works, Hebrews 9.14. Those who have entered into his rest, Hebrews 4, 9 and 10, have ceased from their works. So it's not about our works at all. It's about God's works flowing through us. His works are good. His works are perfect. And uh, as we allow his works to flow through us, then he accomplishes great things through us to his glory. But it's all about him. So we need to remember that uh, works of the law, old covenant, letter, flesh, these are all synonyms that have passed away for those who are God's kingdom people. These things have passed away. The cross did away with old covenant, did away with works of the law, did away with works of the flesh, did away with the letter. Uh, all that was under a different domain. And, um, you know, life in the spirit is in contrast to all of that. And now we get into verse 7, which these are the two verses, verse 7 and verse 9, that really force me to recognize that you can't possibly say you're under law or say we're under the old covenant law or say we're under the Ten Commandments and still claim that we're under grace. That there, there's a gross contradiction here. Because the old covenant law written in stone, specifically talking about the Ten Commandments here in verse 7, is now a ministry of death. That's what Paul says. It's now a ministry of death. Not because there was something wrong with this law. Paul says this law even had glory in terms of accomplishing its purpose, which was to be a schoolmaster, Galatians 3.24, to lead people to Jesus. That was its full purpose. It couldn't save anybody. It was, it was impotent as far as saving anybody, but it could at least point people to Jesus who was the Savior. That was its total purpose. It was perfect in fulfilling that purpose, but that purpose has now been fulfilled, okay? So uh, the law is holy, just, and good, Paul says in Romans seven twelve, but it's fulfilled its purpose now. It has no purpose once Jesus has come and accomplished his perfect finished work. It has no purpose in the kingdom. They can still have a purpose for people who uh, have never heard of Jesus or who haven't accepted Jesus, who, who need to be governed by law. So we'll notice here that it uses both the term that it's obsolete and done away with and is becoming obsolete. That's very interesting. It uses both. For God's kingdom people, the old covenant law is now obsolete. It's completely done. No longer serves any function for us. But for people who are not in Christ, who are not functioning in the kingdom, that law can still serve a purpose. So it is passing away, Paul says, uh, for them. Um, again, when we look at uh, this ministry of death, you know, that, that's a very powerful term. Uh, and growing up in a church that was under law, um, we were always taught, well, the laws that were done away with were the ceremonial laws. You know, Colossians 2, the laws that got nailed to his cross were the ordinances that were against us. And because they used the word ordinances there, um, which the, the, the word means all regulations, all laws. But in the King James, they used the word ordinances. So the, the church said, oh, well, that's just the ceremonial laws that got nailed to the cross. It wasn't the whole law. Uh, we know it wasn't the whole law because we keep the Ten Commandments and that's what makes us the remnant church, you know. So it couldn't have been the Ten Commandments. But uh, we know full well that it w included the Ten Commandments because 
the moral law is the main part of the law that's against us. It's not the ceremonial law that condemns us for the most part. It's the moral law that condemns us. So the whole law was nailed to his cross. And Jesus says he disarmed principalities by doing that. He took away the devil's ability to condemn and judge us because we're no longer under that law that we can't perfectly keep. So um, that law has become a ministry of death. That's all it's good for is bringing death to people who put themselves under that law. And then in verse 8, he says, we are under the ministry of the Spirit. Okay? What is the ministry of the Spirit? It's the law of the Spirit. Romans 8, 2. These are synonyms. The ministry of the Spirit and the law of the Spirit are the same thing. And you say, well, what's the difference between the law of the Spirit and the Old Covenant law? The first difference is condemnation. Anyone who's under the Old Covenant law is condemned because they can't keep it, it brings death, and it brings condemnation. Um, but if we're under the law of the Spirit, there is no condemnation. Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for you who are in Christ under the law of the Spirit, verse 2, not under the law of sin and death, not under the old covenant law that condemns. And, and you say, well, what's the practical difference? The practical difference is that as God's kingdom people, he calls us to righteousness rather than convicting us of sin. There's a big difference there. When you read John uh, 16, 8 to 11, it talks about three kinds of conviction. He convicts the world of sin. He convicts unbelievers, it says. He convicts those who do not believe of sin. Okay? So anyone who is not a true believer is convicted of sin. Those who are true believers, what does it say? It says he convicts them of righteousness. That's a big difference. You know, it's a big difference to me to have someone condemning me and putting me down versus saying, hey, you know, I know who you are. And I, I know that this is who you really are. You know, it's like Simba. Simba, remember who you are. You're a child of the king. We're children of the king of hearts. He knows who we are. So if we do happen to believe a lie or partner with a lie of the enemy and make a mistake, God says, hey, that's not who you are. You're this person. Uh, as he is, so are you in this world. This is how I see you. I see you as this righteous person. I'm calling you to this righteousness. It's the goodness of God that leads to repentance in the kingdom. So we want to convict people of their goodness and who God has called them to be rather than putting them down and judging them and condemning them. Those are the tools of the enemy. It does say that the enemy is convicted of judgment. That's the third conviction here. So it is interesting that the devil and his kind have already been convicted of judgment. So that's a whole different category that this text talks about. And we need to remind the enemy of that when he comes after us. Hey, you're already convicted of judgment. So I'm convicted of righteousness. Get out of here. Um, verse 9, and well, back to this whole thing of the enemy. Um, you know, if we're going to do battle with an enemy, we want to make sure that we have the higher ground. We want to make sure that we're going to win the battle. You know, if you're going to go to war with somebody, you don't want to lose the war. And uh, the only way we can have that advantage or higher ground over the enemy is through the perfect finished work of Christ and being covered by the blood, being covered by grace. The moment we put ourselves under law, old covenant law, that gives the enemy the advantage. Now he can condemn us. Now he can judge us. So th that's not where we want to be. Reminds me of the story of the... Uh, uneducated farmer who had this huge, gigantic crop of watermelons. And his fields were right up against this public high school. And he was having all kinds of problems because the high school kids would come over in the hot weather and take his watermelons and just help themselves, help themselves to these watermelons. And he was losing a lot, of, a lot of watermelons. So he came up with this idea. He said, I'm not going to let these educated people make a fool out of me. I'm going to take care of them. And so he posts a sign right where they were coming into his field that said, warning, attention, one of these watermelons has been injected with cyanide. 
and he thought that would take care of these guys. But uh, what he didn't realize is all these guys were taking high school chemistry. And they said, hey, that's a good idea. So the next day when the farmer went out to check his sign, there was a second sign there and said, attention, warning, now two watermelons have been injected <laughs> with cyanide. So this guy kind of cut his own throat. He had his own, uh, his whole crop put at risk because he thought he was getting rid of his enemy. But the truth is that his enemy was smarter than he was. And, um, you know, the devil might be smarter than we are intellectually, but he's spiritually impotent against us when we're under the blood, when we're under the perfect finished work of Christ. He's totally and completely a defeated foe. We have absolutely no reason to fear him at all. And uh, that can't be true when you're under law. I think I told you about the time I was doing a deliverance with a group of people and several of them were under law. And uh, when they started trying to name the demons and bring them out of this kid, uh, the demons started verbally naming their sins. And they got all red-faced and they left the group because uh, they were under law and the enemy had permission to expose them. So it's particularly a good idea not to do deliverance if you're under law. <laughs> I, I definitely do not recommend that because the enemy has permission to expose you and make a fool of you. He can't do that when we're under the blood. He has no ability to do that when we're under the blood. On to verse 9. Uh, so we're, we're getting really clear here. Verse 7, the old covenant law written by God's finger in stone is now a ministry of death, Paul says. We're not under that law. We are under the ministry of the Spirit, verse 8. And just to reconfirm this again in verse 9, he says that old covenant is also a ministry of condemnation. It's not just a ministry of death. It's a ministry of condemnation. So people who say we're under the Ten Commandments today are completely flying in the face of what Paul is saying here. Those Ten Commandments are now a ministry of death and they're a ministry of condemnation. And when we put ourselves under them, we give the enemy permission to trash us and condemn us and judge us. We rearm him. Jesus said he disarmed principalities at the cross. We rearm those principalities when we put ourselves under law. And um, so this was really the passage that forced me to rethink my theology, my training, my seminary, uh, because I had to ask myself the question, how can a law that is called a ministry of condemnation and death be made the source of denominational identity and pride? That's the last thing you want to be proud of. That's the last thing you want to make the source of your identity is something that is a ministry of condemnation and death. And um, so, you know, when this passage really finally hit home to me, I, I no longer believed I was under law, under the old covenant law, under the Ten Commandments. And there was a new freedom and joy and experience with God that blossomed in ways that it never could have done had I remained under law and my thinking. So, uh, you know, verse 10 says that this old covenant did have glory. It had glory in that it served God's purpose for why it was given in the old covenant times. But it, Paul says that glory is absolutely nothing compared to the glory that comes through the new covenant. And the new covenant is nothing more than the everlasting covenant perfectly revealed through Jesus Christ. The everlasting covenant was always there. God's grace was always there. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. The Noahic covenant was a covenant of grace. The Abrahamic covenant was a covenant of grace. When God came to these individuals in the Old Testament, he called them to a covenant of grace. He called them to the everlasting covenant. He did not call them to the Sinaitic covenant. Uh, the Davidic covenant was a covenant of grace. And it's very important to understand this because um, the perfect finished work of Christ uh, was available even to people before Jesus died on the cross. He was the lamb slain from the very foundation 
of the world. And uh, we'll, we'll note more about that in a few moments. But I, I just want to say this was a high week for me in the sense that uh, I have two brothers. And um, many years ago, my youngest brother, who really wanted nothing to do with religiosity, we, all three of us grew up in a religious subculture under law with the religious spirit, and we all kind of reacted to it in different ways. Uh, my two younger brothers left religion and wanted nothing to do with it. Um, one of them was gay, and the other one just kind of chose a life of hedonism, doing his own thing. And uh, I had this crazy notion that I could somehow change this religious subculture. But uh, so I ended up going into the ministry, and, and that was totally God's doing, because you know from my story that I was very secular by nature. I love sports. That's the only thing I cared about or thought about. I was, uh, you know, much more of a uh, Esau than I was uh, Jacob. And uh, my mom often just was chagrined about this because she prayed for me like no other time in her life when I, she was pregnant with me. And uh, she was just sure God was going to do something with me. And here I was, this Esau, and she couldn't understand it, you know, totally my my dad's kid, totally thought and loved nothing but sports. Um, and, uh, and it was a, a bunch of miracles of God. You know, I just have to attribute it to my mother's prayer. Because God did a bunch of stuff that was just ridiculous to pull me out of my worldview and it give me any kind of interest in going into the ministry and that kind of thing. So it was all about my mother's prayers and God's answers to those prayers and God's supernatural grace. It wasn't that I had any more spiritual inclination than my two brothers. But um, several years ago, I gave my youngest brother Joseph Prince's book, because he at least has kind of a little openness to spiritual stuff. And that book really changed his life. And uh, he really became excited about spiritual things and grace. And his son, too, came along. His son was baptized in our, over at Pastor Joe's house, uh, I don't know if you remember that, but uh, that was my brother's son that was baptized there who was in the Marine Corps and stuff. And, uh, but anyway, my brother that's gay has never shown the slightest inclination to talk about spiritual things. We, we just, that was always a mute subject when we'd get together. We never brought up anything to do with religion. And I think part of that was kind of the condemnation that he felt growing up. We didn't even know he was gay till after he graduated from college, but he knew he was, and he knew how the church spoke against that kind of thing. So I think he had this strong condemnation uh, in his religious experience. But anyway, um, my mom was radically touched by Joseph Prince's book, too, and I gave that to her. And she had given one to my brother, Lair, uh, who's the gay brother. And he never looked at it, you know, we didn't see any change or difference in him. But he's been through a lot just recently, he went through these surgeries, his life was even at risk for a while in the hospital, it was real tense times. And that, that in and of itself wasn't enough to bring him back to the God. But uh, just this week, uh, it was Tuesday night I guess, he couldn't sleep. And he's been recovering quite well, but he just couldn't sleep. And so he gets up out of bed and he turns on the TV. And of all things, Joseph Prince is on. And uh, he's like blown away by this guy. And he's never heard a sermon like this. And then he remembers, hey, my family gave me that book. And uh, he went back and he dug it out. And he said he like read the whole book. I mean, he just, he, he spent the whole rest of the day. He's on disability right now. So... He had time. He just read the whole book. And when my mom called me Wednesday night, she had tears in her eyes. And Lair said he's a new man. He's in Christ. And it was just so awesome, you know, uh, that she says, you know, I know what the Bible means when it says there's incredible joy in heaven. Yes. Uh, when a sinner comes back to God. And uh, so I've been on a high ever since that, even though the Dodgers and Angels are losing. But... Uh, <laughs> You know, that was just the highlight of my week, definitely. And um, th there's nothing quite like when someone actually captures what the finished work accomplished and realizes what the religious spirit is and, and what uh, 
the counterfeit of the enemy is and how they've been exposed to that their whole life and that's who they thought God was and that's what they thought the church was but now they realize it's something altogether different and they're just filled with this joy and, and excitement in the Lord and um, so that brings us to verse 11 again this is what I mentioned Paul says what is passing away what is passing away and um, someone might say, well, see, we're still under the Old Covenant law because it says it is passing away. It hasn't quite passed away yet. But Paul makes it very clear here that God's kingdom people are not under this Old Covenant law. It is a ministry of death and condemnation, but it does have a place for those who are not in Christ, who are not under the blood, who are not functioning in the spirit. People still need law in their lives, so that law can still serve a purpose for people who are not in Christ. So it is passing away still for them. And it's not fully passed away as far as they're concerned. And we see the same terminology over in Hebrews 8.13. Uh, the author of Hebrews says, that law has now become obsolete, past tense. He's talking about for God's people, for those who are in Christ. But then he turns around and says, it is becoming obsolete. And that's talking about for those who are not in Christ. So we need to make this distinction. But Paul says here in verse 12, for those who are in Christ, it gives us a boldness of speech. There's an incredible boldness that comes to us when we understand the power of the blood, when we've accepted the perfect finished work of Christ. It gives us a boldness that's unlike anything else. I got a big kick out of Teresa and Helen's boldness on the street Thursday night. They were recruiting people. I, I'm not to that place very good. I, I, don't, I still don't go out and recruit people very well. But they were recruiting people and bringing them right in, and I was blessed by that. I, I like that kind of boldness. And, and the Bible's filled with boldness when it talks about the finished work. Hebrews 4:16. Um, Come boldly now to the throne of grace. Uh, we're under now the blood, we're under the perfect finished work, so we can come boldly now to the very throne of God and receive his grace. Hebrews 10, 19, we enter into the holy of holies with great boldness through the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ brings us into the very center of God's being, uh, the holy of holies without any fear or trepidation. Um, you know, th this is the neat thing about David, is that um, here he was under the old covenant, and yet when he brought the ark back, what did he do? He set it right up in the middle of the camp, he surrounded it by 24-7 worship, and he had the entire camp come and worship immediately before the ark. No curtain, no veil. Um, I mean, this was just completely ridiculous as far as old covenant law was concerned. They all should have been put to death. But David was not under that old covenant law. He had transcended it. He was functioning in the everlasting covenant. He was looking by faith forward to the lamb that would be slain for the entire world. And uh, he had the faith, and God didn't come against him for that because God knew his heart. Once again, he's the king of hearts. And he knew David's heart was right, that his faith was right. So David had this incredible boldness, even in Old Testament times, that, that's amazing. And when I say boldness, I, I don't want us to confuse that with arrogance. You know, uh, boldness is something different than arrogance. The Bible calls us to boldness, but it also calls us to humility at the same time. Reminds me of the story of uh, the two men that were sitting up in a restaurant in a bar drinking and talking and this bar was many many stories off the ground and it had a little uh, area where you could go out with a balcony and look down and uh, the one man said to the other I, I bet you a hundred dollars I can go out and jump off that balcony and come back up over the rail and the other guy said you're crazy man you're drunk don't do that but if you're going to do it I'll be glad to bet you but Put your hundred dollars here first because you'll be gone so the guy goes out he jumps over the rail jumps right back up and 
The other guy asked to pay him 100 bucks. He says, how'd you do that? That's ridiculous. And uh, he said, I'll, I'll do you a double or nothing. I bet you can't do that again. Goes out, jumps over the rail, comes cruising back up. The guy said, how is that possible? He didn't think there was a ledge or anything. And so uh, he says, OK, we'll make it double or nothing again, only this time I'll do it. And so uh, the other guy goes out, jumps over the rail, and dives 20 stories to the pavement below. And uh, the waitress walks up to the other guy, and she says, you know, you can be such a jerk when you've had too much to drink, Superman. Yeah. Superman can do stuff the rest of us can't but Superman's not real uh, God is real and he has unlimited power and we can be thankful that he's never bad you know he's never screwing us he's never hurting us he's never coming against us he's good all the time that's the beauty of the gospel he's good all the time He's not playing tricks on us to laugh at us or ridicule us or make fun of us. He's good all the time. The Old Covenant required a veil, verse 13, Paul says. Moses had to have a veil when he'd been with God. He had to veil, veil himself from the people in terms of bearing God's glory. And the uh, tabernacle had a veil that separated the people from the most holy place. And you know, the high priest could only go in there once a year and he had to have a rope tied around his leg in case he wasn't right with God and he had to drag him out dead. So, uh, you know, the old covenant was totally about having this veil between man and God. But uh, like David, when you're under the new covenant, the veil disappears. David got rid of the veil because he was under the everlasting covenant. And once we're under the blood, once we understand the perfect finished work of Christ, there's no place for the veil anymore. But Paul says here in verse 14 that that same veil that existed in the minds and hearts of the people in the Old Testament remains today when people are under the Old Covenant law, when they put themselves under that law, when they read the Old Testament and think that that applies in terms of the Ten Commandments and all those laws, they put that same veil back between themselves and God. And, uh, you know, the, it's a tragic thing. It, it's a totally unnecessary thing. And Jesus says, I mean, uh, Paul says, even though Jesus has taken that veil away, people put it back through their hearts and minds that are blinded to the gospel, that are blinded to the perfect finished work of Christ. Verse 15, that veil remains over people's hearts who have been blinded to the truth. And uh, this happens in systems, it happens in religious systems, it happens in families. Um, it's always a, a difficult thing when you have a family where some people are under law and some people are uh, functioning under the perfect finished work of Christ. And you know, we had a get together last weekend that I was a little nervous about because uh, we have some new family that's come and they've joined our church and then we were all getting together with some that are bigwigs in the former church. And, but it, it went really well. I, I felt like the Lord really blessed. There was no conflict. Nothing came up that was negative. So, you know, God can take care of all that stuff, but we have to pray through that and we have to pray that God will intervene in those situations because human nature isn't so. Verse 16 where the message of grace is, where the perfect finished work is found, the veil has been lifted. So the veil has been taken away for those who have the message of grace and who have the perfect finished work functioning in their lives. And, and it makes all the difference in the world, just like the difference I saw in my brother this week. Uh, th there's nothing that can quite compare to the difference of being behind the veil versus having the veil removed. Which leads us to verse 17, and this is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. God is a spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, there's freedom. The reason this verse has so much meaning to me 
is that uh, for 20 years I prayed for the gift of tongues, starting in 1985, and the Lord chose not to give it to me. And I studied it a lot. I, I said, I know this gift has great power, and you know, it, it's a wonderful thing to be able to uh, have in your spiritual arsenal. And the Lord just was choosing not to give it to me. And I think it had everything to do with the subculture I was ministering in and how that was going to be misunderstood and all the problems I would encounter if I was speaking in tongues. So, but, but in 2005, when I went up to Bethel with a group from the church, um, Mahesh Chavda was ministering that weekend at Bethel, and I'd been super blessed by his ministry. He has a ton of awesome books, including an awesome book on speaking in tongues, the Hidden Power of Speaking in Tongues. Almost all his books are in, in, entitled The Hidden Power of This, The Hidden Power of That. And uh, they're awesome books. But anyway, he made a very powerful call. If, if you've had a heart or a desire for tongues, and that's never happened for you, the Lord's giving that to you tonight. And uh, I was thrilled that as he made that call that the Lord just gave me these syllables that were really weird. I, I didn't really know what to expect because I, I didn't know what tongues was like. And uh, it, it was just this weird thing. God gave me these kind of nonsense syllables and I just kept saying them and, and I was just kind of really excited because this had been a 20 year wait. And um, it, it, you know, his whole thing was he was singing this, God is the spirit where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, liberty. And he was just walking through the congregation and touching us and uh, that song, the, that verse just got branded into my heart and mind and memory uh, based on that experience that night. And um, I, I have found tongues to be a very powerful thing, but I don't think I've even tapped the beginning of what it can be. I, I really believe I'm just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what tongues really can be. And I know I've heard from Patricia King and so many others who have a very powerful ministry in tongues, uh, what it can be. You know, Gail Reddig has come and ministered to us on several occasions. And you can see, she was really the first one that convinced me that tongues was a very powerful, powerful gift. Because, uh, you know, I asked her, when did you start speaking in tongues? Because she actually got converted by an Adventist, which is, you've heard her, some of you've heard her tell her story. But she never was an Adventist, but she became a Christian because some Adventists led her to the Lord. And um, she said, you know, I, I, it wasn't like I was really pursuing the gift, but I was just worshiping God with all my heart. And I finally came to the place where my human words were no longer adequate to worship him and praise him. And the Lord just gave me this heavenly language to praise him with. And uh, that became a, a very powerful part of my worship. And the next thing I know, he was giving me that in my public ministry. And I would speak in tongues, and then he would give me an interpretation of what those tongues said. And the tongues would say, this person has bowel cancer, or whatever it happened to be. And uh, I would pray over them, and they'd be healed. And so the tongues became very much related to words of knowledge and practical healing gifts and it all worked together and tied together and we saw that happen with many people uh, you know as she's ministered I, I first saw it in the prison uh, she was just having this ridiculously powerful ministry at Norco prison and we were going there from the university and uh, I, and I would just be dumbstruck by the way the chapel would be absolutely packed every time she was there and she would sing and then she would speak in tongues then she would get a word of knowledge, and then there would be a miracle and a healing, and it, it was just awesome, and, and I was just overwhelmed, and to this day, she's a very good friend of mine, but uh, anyway, that's why this particular passage uh, has so much meaning to me, and um, I really believe, you know, wherever you are in the journey, I know some of you said, I've been praying for tongues, and I haven't received it yet. Don't feel bad about that. I had to wait 20 years. You know, uh, God's timing is always perfect. He knows when it's going to be best for us to experience certain spiritual breakthroughs. But uh, I'm sure we'll talk about tongues more as that will be coming up in the Roman series and 
some other things. But we close off our uh, sermon today with verse 18. Uh, By beholding him, we become changed. Uh, Unveiled. You notice he calls us to this unveiled experience with him. No more law, no more old covenant, no more condemnation, no more death. Uh, He's called us into life. He's called us into joy. He's called us into the fullness of his perfect finished work, which releases the Holy Spirit, which releases true unity in the body, which releases the uh, radical inclusiveness that he's called us to. And uh, then it says we move in this context from glory to glory to glory. Uh, So we're, we're never, it's an interesting paradox. I think we experience Uh, the fullness of peace resting in him when we've entered into his rest he's given us a true peace but we're not satisfied spiritually in other words we don't think we've arrived or achieved like Paul says I think Paul had a full peace in the kingdom but he says it's not like I have achieved everything I continue to grow and that's why I like Wigglesworth so well that he calls us to ever increasing hunger for God ever-increasing humility before God and ever-increasing faith in the perfect finished work of Christ. When we flow in these things, we will truly experience the fullness of the King of Hearts. God bless you.